Hello everyone, welcome to my studio. My name is Eric Hermann. I'm uh, doing a short video tutorial. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it short for this template that I've created uh, for Ableton called Rapid Flow. So yeah, just a, a quick uh, info on where you can get this template. Uh, it's over on uh, Gumroad. Uh, I'll link it below the video. And uh, yeah, you can just head on over there. The price for it is uh, one dollar, one euro. And uh, yeah, before we start, let me give you a quick uh, idea of uh, what uh, the template can do and uh, what it sounds like. Um, so um, I'm just going to run into the second track on this set. Switch off the speakers and putting on a headphone would probably be a good idea. All right, so let's have a play with this. I hope that gives you a bit of an idea of uh, what you can do with this template. Um, so yeah, let me uh, give you first maybe a little bit of input why I, I made this and um, yeah, a little bit of background maybe also on, on myself. I'll keep it very short. Um, so yeah, I've been making music and uh, I actually studied sound engineering something like I think it was 25 years ago or something in, in, in Amsterdam. And since then I worked for a pretty long time as a, as a sound engineer and a musician. Um, these days I'm no longer a professional musician. Uh, I do IT consulting, but I still love music and I love being in the studio. Um, and what I found is that um, I would spend a long time working on tracks in a very linear way, making a sequence, you know, drawing out the blocks and doing all the things. And it just, it, it became a chore at a certain point. And I'm decently disciplined, so I would get through it, but it really wouldn't be that much more fun. Um, and also the results were then maybe technically quite okay, I guess, but just it, it didn't really catch me anymore that much. And um, I've come across a lot of people that make music, some as a hobby, uh, some full time. And it just, yeah, it seems to be a very long, painstaking process for many of us. And through um, collaborating with uh, people and doing master classes uh, with amazing musicians such as uh, Frank Miedemann or Sebastian Müllert, I started to realize that um, a lot of the advice they give in their master classes is about how to keep the creativity and the positive flow in your music. And of course, also some, some sort of technical tips and ideas, uh, how you can make sure that uh, you hold the space for being creative without being too distracted from all the technical things. Um, so what uh, they do and what many people I've seen uh, using live to play um, gigs and to work in the studio do is stick to a very simple template, which is in essence what I've also built here. Um, where you have uh, eight tracks and in those eight tracks everything has to happen that can make up a track um, for uh, live playing. I know it sounds daunting at first. Initially I was also like, whoa, okay, how is this going to work? But it is doable and the beauty of doing it in this way is that you can then control your whole set uh, through one simple controller. It can be the Akai APC40 MK2, which is quite nice, uh, but you could also do it with something simple like the Akai MIDI Mix. Um, so let me show you a little bit what's happening in these tracks, a little bit of sound, a little bit of music. We have a few options uh, for kick drums. So yeah, those are all just samples that I've sort of pre-mixed to a certain level, to a certain peak intensity so that they will work in the track. 
And there's also a few other samples in there. So you'll see there's some hi-hat samples in there and there's also some claps and snares and rim shots to get you started um, and to have a good foundation for where you know the drums, if you mix them in at this level, um, they'll be all right, they'll, they'll sound good. And there's a nice little element here that the decays of the hi-hats are mapped to controller 8. So when you set this template up, uh, please use the MIDI map functionality and map your controller 8 to the hi-hat decay. And that will allow you to uh, adjust the groove of your hi-hats or also do kind of little build-ups while you're playing uh, just by rotating this. But to give you to give you a bit of an idea what that does, it's really nice to be able to adjust the groove of the hi-hats while you're playing live or while you're making a track to get it to sit just right. The second track is uh, basses. And I think many of you will hear that already has delays and uh, some reverb, I think, even in it. There's no sense happening on these tracks and actually none of these tracks have any real effect processing. I know there's some plugins here, we're going to get into that but all that reverb and delay is mixed into the file, so it's recorded that way. Uh, the third track is for groove elements, so I tend to put toms there. Again, you can hear there's a lot of stuff there. And the fourth track is for percussion type sounds. The fifth track is for um, melodies and atmospheric stuff. Let me jump to a different track so I can show you what that track sounds like. And the sixth track is uh, reserved for pads. other sort of melodic harmonic content. Um, the seventh track is where you would typically put your uh, hook uh, or your uh, vocal maybe uh, inside. And that's it. The um, final track would be reserved for atmospheric sort of effects, risers, fallers, things like that. I, I didn't actually put anything like that in. I ran out of time a little bit making this template. It's, yeah, it's, it, it was a lot more work than I realized. Actually figuring out how OBS, this video, OBS video streaming software works. My God, that took longer than making the template. Anyway, so please, you know, just drop some sort of whooshes and washes in there and, and some background noises if you want to add some atmospherics to your tracks. Um, yes, um, so let's have a little bit more in-depth look at what's in these tracks. Um, let's have a look, for example, at the kick drum. We have a, a drum rack. There is an EQ in every track that is there for live fixes. So if you're playing somewhere and the PA is set up weirdly or you've, you know, misunderestimated the way that um, your subs are set up, you can use this to quickly fix that problem. This was a fantastic tip uh, from Frank Wiedemann, actually. He picked it up from someone, but he Again, but he spoke about it in his masterclass and it just really makes sense. So this is the only time when I would say, yeah, okay, if you need to fix something quickly live, this is a good place to do it. Um, the other thing that uh, is here is a sub or infra bass cleaning um, uh, track, which basically gets rid of very low basses on tracks that have bass instruments because you don't really need them. They're just going to clog up the PA. 
Then there is a subs low cut, both on the kick and on the bass. So what this does is it gives you a possibility to um, yeah, do some uh, nice low cutting to build up some tension. Um, so that's routed um, uh, here and this is something that you will need to do. This was a great tip also from uh, Mr. Wiedemann that it makes no sense having a master fader on stage. You can only do bad things with it. Either you'll put it up and things will clip or things will be low in volume and you may not know why at four or five in the morning. So what you please need to do is assign your master fader, again using the media sign function, to here. Just click it, move it around, and the same is true for the bass. You'll see a similar EQ like that, again with a, a macro, just assign the master fader to that. And so now when you move the master fader, you'll cut lows from the kick and the bass. They're set a little bit differently because if you go all the way up to like 10K, then you don't hear anything anymore. So there's a certain amount of kind of a limitation how far this can go. This is a cool thing that I kind of discovered recently. If you click on map and you open this up, you can tell it how far up and down it's allowed to go. Um, I'm, wow, I'm getting a sandwich from my lovely missus. Thank you. I'm recording <laughs> this thing here. Mwah. Mwah. Wow, I'm a very lucky guy. Um, so yes, let me uh, continue here and, uh, wow, this looks amazing. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to get through this here in a second to be able to have my lunch, um, but let me just keep this going because I wanna just record this in one flow. If I have to edit this video, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna lose it. It's uh, too many things to do. Um, so yes, here for example, you can set up where this uh, control uh, has its uh, limits, which is actually yeah, a really nice way to make sure that when you're automating stuff or actually using these faders live, you don't overdo it. Uh, and that's a good point. It's the same on the channel faders. So when everything's all the way at the top on the APC or your control unit, then it's mixed properly, which is why every channel has a utility on it. Uh, here it is, that removes 60B of gain, because you have 60B at the top of the fader, that way you have a unity gain uh, throughout um, the signal flow. You will see that there's a limiter uh, on many elements, uh, almost every track in the mix, and that is to make sure that the levels that we're sending out have a certain um, constants uh, going out. Ooh. Okay, my, I'm just checking that my mic is still working because I did this once before and the mic wasn't going. Okay, good, it's going still. Um, yes, yeah, so um, the limiter will clamp down on sounds if they're coming into it too hot on individual tracks. This is actually something that I learned from watching Deadmau5's work in his uh, tutorial. And yeah, it just made a lot of sense. Uh, it also takes some of the load off the mastering chain. So if you have a look at the, the kick and bass here, So in this case, it's barely touching it, but there's another track where actually the bass does go into the limiter. There you can see it. This is sounding a bit wobbly because this track is on 124 BPM. Uh, let's go back here. Um, yeah, so um, sometimes you'll see the kick and the bass actually hitting that limiter mildly, which is okay, as long as it isn't, you know, going massively into it, it's fine. Uh, and that's just keeping the level, level set at a certain place so that in the end, when you sum everything to your master, to your mastering chain, um, things work out together. Wow, oh, this is a 20 BPM version of the track now, that's actually kind of cool. Um, yes, so um, basically what you can do um, is just put your sounds into these tracks the way you want to hear them in the mix. 
don't further process on these tracks. Don't do automation and kind of, you know, set up um, things that go in and off and in and out um, because it's going to get really confusing. Trust me, I've ruined my own set actually that I need to clean after this by doing all kinds of stuff in these tracks. The idea is consider this like a tape machine with eight tracks and you just put the stuff in there that you need. The place to compose and really work on fine tuning your sounds is back here. Um, is in these compose tracks where you can then resample um, and then when you have it perfect the way you want it with the delays, effects, compression, sidechain, everything you need, you take it over to the track here or resample it into that track as a loop and then you're done. And then when you put up that fader, you know it's always going to sound the same. You won't have automation and heavy processing going on. So a nice thing is actually that this template running full blast, uh, full tilt is like 10% on my CPU. There we go. All right, we still had some effects going on. Yeah, so working in this way and using Ableton's um, own onboard plugins, that's actually something that's very cool. Ableton sent me a license for Ableton 9 as an NFR, so this uh, set is backwards compatible. And yeah, you, we're just using the built-in stuff from Ableton here. Um, yeah, so thank you, Ableton, for that. That was super cool. Uh, I always hate it when I get someone's stuff for Ableton and it turns out to be 11.12.13 uh, and I have some other version and it doesn't open. So you should be able to open this with any version of Ableton starting at 9. Sweet, you will need sweet. Um, where were we? Yes, so these tracks are like tape machines. Uh, you just uh, drop stuff in here and if you see the limiters really clamping down on your signal, you probably will need to work on it still. And maybe just to highlight that, you know, Obviously, this isn't the only way to make music. This is just a fast workflow that I found. Um, and I'm a lifelong learner. I'm always open and interested in learning new things. If you have tips, ideas, feedbacks, cool racks that you want to share, you know, that we could put into this, that would be super cool. Um, so by no means, this is the only right way to do this. This is just a good way to start maybe and get some good results that will sound good. Um, but uh, none of this is fixed rules. It's, it's just some suggestions based off of best practices of how I've seen people work and what I've seen in uh, yeah, consuming a ridiculous amount of masterclasses and YouTube videos. Um, yeah, I think that covers it. So the rest is just audio tracks with very basic, uh, with a limiter and uh, a reduction in uh, the uh, output. Maybe it's good practice actually. Yeah, there is bass mono on a lot of the tracks to make sure that you don't have big wide stuff going on in the low end. Um, and that's it. Nothing more happening on these tracks. Um, all of these tracks are routed to a track which is called Mastering, which as you see has the monitor input on, but that again is uh, routed then via crossfader side A to the actual output master. So we're not mastering on the main output. There's only a, a spectrum analyzer there. Uh, we're only mastering on, let me switch this over so you can see better. We're only mastering on this mastering track. So let's have a look at uh, what's uh, happening in this mastering track. Unfortunately, we can't make that any bigger. Um, so we have the basic, like the effect block, which is what I like to call it here. This is this rapid flow master or something or other it's called. Um, so um, this is where all these buttons are able to influence any sound coming out of your set that is not your reference track. So let's have a listen, uh, yeah, what's, what's there. Many of you will probably already have heard that there's uh, sort of some staples of electronic music are in there. Uh, let me switch this over to the view where you can see both. Bear with me because I'm new to this screencasting stuff. Okay, here we go. So uh, the first seven encoders on the APC are routed to these seven uh, macros. So just make sure that when you set up this template with your APC that you uh, click and route. Um, so now that low cut is controlled um, by this button. Very important detail, in order for you to do that, you need to go to preferences and uh, to the input of the APC, click on remote. Otherwise, somehow it doesn't do it. Um, it'll just keep controlling pans, which is a super useless function, I think, unless you're maybe doing live sound or something like that. 
Um, yeah, so you need to have that on uh, on the APC so that these buttons are also seen as MIDI controllers and uh, then you should be set. So yeah, we have uh, some things here which we can control. Let's have a listen to uh, what that sounds like. So I'm gonna uh, lift a little secret here. I came to the situation where I'd like tweaked sounds here and made this massive hands in the air build up kind of thing. And then when the one was coming, I was like, oh God, how am I gonna get this all back down to zero, which is just not possible. So what I've gone and done is gotten a little uh, foot switch. Here, let me show it to you. It's just one of these things. It's a you know very cheap, typical foot switch, has a bit of tape on it so that I don't lose it in clubs. Thank you, Frank Wiedemann. That was uh, yeah, your tip to make this thing a little bit more visible uh, so that when you're playing, you can actually look down and see it. Otherwise, it's just black. Um, yeah, and what this is doing is that it's bypassing. I've mapped it again, just using MIDI and then, you know, clicking on the entire plugin chain here and clicking on that foot switch. It'll map it um, so that you can switch off the whole effect chain with your foot while you then go back and reset uh, all the uh, buttons to their default values. So let me just show that one more time quickly. Uh, I'm going to put this up on the desk so you can see it. So here's the little uh, little foot switch. All right. Okay. I hope uh, yeah you get the idea. Obviously, um, yeah you have to get everything back to zero uh, when you let this go. But this just makes it so that you can switch everything off when the one comes, and then take your time uh, to set your sounds back up the way they should be. Um, yes. So we were looking at uh, the effects chain. So we have a low cut, a high cut. Let me uh, zoom into the APC so you can have a look. Uh, low cut, high cut, we have a wash out, we have a reverb, which kind of does the same thing. Um, you can combine, of course, the reverb with low cut and, and, and make uh, also a nice effect there. We have a very short little delay here. Uh, if I scroll a little bit here, you'll be able to see it coming up on Ableton if you have very good eyesight. Uh, there is a second longer delay, which is actually my preferred one of the two. I really like how that one sounds. I think that one gives me away, gives away my uh, trance background. I, uh, I, used, I started out making side trance many, many a year ago. And uh, yeah, those Atmos basses, Atmos, awesome, you're the man. Uh, yeah, they still get me to these days. Um, yes, so uh, moving right along, what do we have? We have two delays, um, and then we have a phaser, uh, which is actually most fun on headphones. I'm not quite sure what it'll do in a club. This is kind of a recent addition. Uh, not sure if I can recommend that, uh, but uh, yeah, let's have a listen to it. So that's a phaser. Of course, you can change out any of these effects with something you would like to use. Um, and that's it. That's the effects that you have. Now, the cool thing about having this in the input monitoring uh, channel of Ableton is that you can send anything to this, also the tracks that you're maybe working on, uh, and use those effects to maybe make some kind of a sound or tweak something and then record it, and then you're done. Uh, so it's like a very powerful way to just always have a lot of control over the sounds in your set, uh, both live and in the studio. Um, what else is on this thing? Uh, that's the effects. Uh, so that's basically all this stuff over here. I'm actually going to leave it open so then you can see a little bit if I'm tweaking stuff, what's going on. 
Um, then we come to the mastering chain. And uh, yeah, this is uh, where the heavy lifting happens that takes this set from sounding like just studio kind of, you know, demo um, sketch to something that's just, yeah, a bit more compelling on the dance floor. Obviously, if you create a track in this and build it into a sequence, I would recommend mastering it separately out of this sequence uh, with your mastering flow. But this is something that I've managed to build, which is pretty good. It, it holds up quite well um, for live. So let me play you the track with and without the mastering. Yes, so what the mastering is doing is uh, it's removing some mud. Uh, we just with a simple EQ around 200. This is sort of best practice uh, in, in sound engineering. Often this area doesn't sound really nice. Um, it has a bit of a mid lift, not too much, uh, 2 dBs and a bit of a highs lift. Notice this isn't a shelf because all the stuff up here, just it just hurts your ears to quote Mr. Ein Musik which, you know, he's absolutely right. You don't need this stuff all the way up here. It doesn't sound nice on a system. It just hisses and gives you tinnitus. So thank you uh, for, for that tip. He uses a decimort on a lot of his drums and stuff to reduce those high frequencies, which I actually also do often after seeing his fantastic tutorial over on Sine. Sine? Sine? Sine, I think it's called. Really cool tutorials. Also, there's one there of stimming, which is super cool. Rob Babich has his uh, tutorial there. Also very much recommend uh, checking those out. So yeah, this is learned from uh, Ein Musik. Uh, Ott, I think, is a staple, probably co-invented of uh, Deadmau5, so over the top. Uh, this is the Ableton version of it. I hope this exists in Ableton 9. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but uh, if it does, you can just clone the settings here because I didn't build it into Ableton 9, I just realized. Um, but yeah, maybe it's good if you do a little bit of uh, this work. Also yourself, you'll learn the plugins and uh, yeah, what they do a bit better if you're a beginner. Um, yeah, and I'm honestly, I'm not going to do it. I need to record this and send it out today. Um, it is time. So what do we have here? The artist doing some work on um, the um, entire frequency spectrum. So yeah, it's giving it a little bit of a, of a lift, mostly in the mids and the highs. Uh, there is again an EQ to adapt your signal to a PA that's not uh, doing what you want or if you've made some mistakes uh, in your mix, then here you can kind of do a quick fix uh, if you need to. But I would recommend leaving this off, uh, especially while you're producing. Then there's a clipper. Uh, and this is interesting. This is actually, to my shame, only something that I've gotten into um, quite recently uh, from watching tutorials from Vince, this very big kind of athletic guy over on YouTube that does uh, tutorials where he did a clipper. I'll, I'll link it somewhere. I'll, I'll write his name because his tutorials were also very cool. Uh, what's his name? This is going to get me now. Let me put in a Pro L2 just to show you what this thing is doing. And thank you to FabFilter for providing this as an NFR also. So basically what this is doing is it's catching some peaks on the channel uh, on the output so that it doesn't go into your limiters and force them to clamp down. <music> You see that peak that came through as soon as I switched off the clipper? Let's have a look. I'm going to leave it off and run the audio again. Now switching on the clipper. So 
It's just chopping away those high peaks when those toms are hitting on the kicks. I've always heard it's best practice not to put, you know, bass and kick together and toms and kicks together, which, yeah, makes a lot of sense somewhere, but I find it, it's a shame if you can't do it. So this is somehow a workaround for that. Otherwise, rhythms all start to sound the same and basses and kicks all start to sound the same. So, uh, yeah, this sort of fixes that problem. You can do some stuff with automation, but I like being able to put kicks and basses on the one sometimes. It, it keeps things, um, yeah, a bit more dynamic, I guess. So, um, I guess a bit more open gives you more possibilities. So I'm going to remove this pro -L. We don't need it for the set. As I said, the set is Ableton Suite only. We have a bus comp with a slow attack, fast release, just a little bit of compression, uh, which is just, you know, gluing together the signal a bit. Let's have a listen. So, you know, it's just doing like a dB or two, but it really adds to the glue. The guys from Cytomic did a great job on this compressor. Um, then we have, of course, the output limiter. And maybe just a, a little uh, something to show you that the ceiling is set to minus one here. That's apparently best practice in what Spotify and iTunes, Apple Music, etc. expect as your maximum level. Because when they encode for streaming, sometimes overs can occur if you're going out all the way to zero minus 0 0.3, right. Um, so this is set so that if you export tracks from this, they'll be ready to stream. But if you're playing live, I guess you could put this up to minus 0 0.3. But if this, uh, you know, 1 dB, 0 0.7 dB is really going to make a difference, I don't know. So I just kind of leave it like that, uh, just so that you know why this is going out at that level. And then there is another utility gain because just for, you know, just to, to make sure that this can't go up somehow by mistake during the set, it's already at max. And this makes make sure that we're not clipping. Okay, so we've gone through now uh, the effects and the mastering chain. Um, Obviously, you know, you can do a lot of stuff here with third-party plugins. I personally use a different limiter uh, on the output. Uh, I like to use one from Slate, which is really cool. I forget the name, but that will be something for a more advanced uh, video. Let's get through this one just using the standard Ableton stuff first. So this is, this is the basis. This is the foundation, I guess we could call it, for the um, set and for building your set and your live set and the cool thing of doing it this way is you can make a track sketch in a couple of cells like literally in 20-30 minutes my mate Sander what's up Sander uh, visited me here in Switzerland a few months ago and yeah we did like four or five track sketches in three days um, and it was just really quick you know just record stuff put it into the cells and we actually or actually I got the pleasure of playing it live uh, a few weeks later without having to do anything more because you can control it and build your sequence and everything out live. So it's a really fast, easy workflow um, to work in. And because everything that you do in the studio is already done in such a way that it's actually kind of live ready, you don't have to spend time transferring from your live uh, or to your live setup from your studio setup. It's all there. And this is something that I saw Frank Wiedemann doing, which I was just like, my God, this makes so much sense. Uh, something that he said also is, you know, Doing it this way, you can uh, test your tracks on the floor and, and see what the response is from people and if they really love it or if you, know, if you know some section is too short, too long, too loud, you can include that feedback uh, into the set that you've created and improve your track and maybe work on um, the tracks that have the strongest response on the floor. I'm not Italianing you here, I just got some, uh, nice, some part of my nice sandwich on my speaker cable, on my headphone cable and now on my hands. Uh, thank you, Ona. You're a, you're a sweetheart. You're my angel uh, for bringing me this nice lunch. I'm actually starving, so I'm going to try to get through this quickly now. Um, good. We've done uh, basically everything on the left here besides the key. This is just a shortish kick drum that we're not hearing. The fader is all the way down. By God, don't put this up by accident during your set. It's not going to be pleasant. Uh, and what this is doing is just sidechaining stuff. Uh, so if I go over here and uh, play you this bass, um, it's just, you know, pushing it to the rhythm of the track. Uh, 
you know, you, you get the drift. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a compressor on that bass instrument. It's being chained from the key. Um, yeah, and, and, and that's it. So I found that it's just really nice to have one key in the key track in the whole uh, uh, set. Of course, if you want a different rhythm to your sidechain, you can move these MIDI notes. But if you ever need to sidechain anything, you know, you know there is a key signal running through your whole set that you can just grab uh, and will be perfectly in time. There is a second part of this set where there's a keychain going on, which is this reverb. We'll get to that in just a sec. Uh, and now comes, I think, I, yeah, kind of the, I guess the biggest hack and the stupidest hack that I never did. You know how people always say, um, oh, I'm just realizing I'm not sharing the screen anymore, apologies. Uh, let me quickly show you the bass side chain again. So here we go. It's um, the key kick drum track uh, is being triggered by MIDI. You can adjust these if you need a different rhythm to your side chain. And uh, here is the compressor receiving its channel from that key track and thus side chaining in time with your track. Um, Yes, um, moving right along, uh, you'll see there's also some basic processing on this track to get it sort of aligned with those other tracks in the set. So this is a composition uh, track. Um, but yeah, this is where you can just go wild and create whatever you want. If it slots into a track at the end of the set here uh, and uh, doesn't you know, go fully into the limiters, then you're probably uh, in the ballpark and it's, it's gonna sound good when you mix it in. So coming now to the thing that actually, yeah, I have to my shame say I've only been doing kind of recently. I, you know how people always say in, in, in uh, sort of magazines and in tutorials and whatnot, you know, make sure that you reference the work that you're doing to professional tracks. And I was always like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to do that when I finish the track and then I'm going to reference it and check, you know, and, and it's actually way too late. If you reference your track after you've mixed and mastered it, you know, it doesn't help much. And, and also referencing in the middle of production is not that easy. Um, somehow. I, I never found a really good way to do it. Uh, and uh, this is why I've built this in um, Ableton. I should say uh, that now I have a plugin that I do that with. I'll add that as bonus material to this. But there's a way to do it in Ableton, which is what I've built here. So I've basically just put in a track of mine that I have the copyrights to so I can add it to this set. And on the crossfader, this is the only track that is going to be. So when I play this... <laughs> See, I have the possibility to crossfade between my track in progress and whatever it is my reference track is. Now, I would really recommend you to support your artists, go to Juno, download or their page and download WAV files of the tracks that you love, that you think are well produced, and put them in here and, and be able to reference against the tracks that you really like throughout your set. Make sure you don't warp them, or if you warp them, do the repitch algorithm, then it won't garble them the way Ableton does. Uh, but actually, it's probably best not to warp them. The reason I have is so that I can start here in the middle of the track and, and spare you the intro of this track. Uh, because, you know, we want to hear the kick, we want to hear the basses and, and, and everything. Otherwise, it'll always start from the very beginning if you don't put warp on. But be aware that it will change the sound of your reference tracks unless you have it on repitch. I guess you could just also bounce a section of the audio you need and just use that and then you can have it fully clean without warping being on on the track. Um, so yes, this is a little workflow to be able to switch between uh, your track and uh, the reference track and this is why on the master we just have a spectrum analyzer. So let me show you what my uh, own track, which in this case is acting as my reference, sounds like. <laughs> See, it's pretty in the ballpark. If you see big deviations here, if like your subs, your, your really low subs are going way up here, if you have a big dip in your mids or your highs are very high here, that's not a good sign. That usually means there's still some work needed on the mix. And you'll see very clearly when you start putting really great 
you know, uh, reference tracks in here from your favorite producers, you'll see the kind of, you know, generally this kind of metering, this, the slope tends to fall a little bit. Um, some pop music is very flat and it's super loud and annoying on the radio, but generally for club stuff, I would recommend to have it falling a little bit so the mids and the highs don't bite your head off uh, when you're standing close to the speakers. And you'll see this on a lot of tracks on reference material uh, that you can use that this is sort of the plot you will see. Uh, yeah, and you'll be able to just switch between any track that you're working on. And your reference track just by using the crossfader. So yeah, a really nice little uh, trick uh, to use the crossfader for that. Uh, and this is why we have this spectrum analyzer on the output here. You can use a more high-end spectrum analyzer, like there's a nice one from Voxemgo. Uh, called Span. I just read an article yesterday that the guy from Voxengo felt that through work he's been doing on a dithering algorithm has now found existence of the divine while creating a dither algorithm. Uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting read over on Gearsluts. Uh, just on a side note, where music and dither algorithms can, uh, can lead us to. Um, yes, back to the matters at hand, spectrum analyzer on your output. Of course, you know, don't rely only on this, but if your monitoring isn't the best or if your room has resonances and nodes in it, um, this is always very helpful. It's, it's a good help, but by no means it's uh, yeah, the only way. Obviously. Um, good, so I think we just have this compose section left. I think, you know, if you make music, you know this, but maybe for the beginners, um, you can just drop your instruments in here that you want to uh, make a sound with. Uh, it can be a drum rack, it can be something or other from Ableton or a third-party vendor. You can, you know, create the MIDI for it, uh, work on it, and when you have it sitting just right, you know, with your other elements of your track, so let's assume that I'm making a bass. God, that's a pretty horrible bass sign. I think I just used this to check the sidechain. What is the filter on this thing? Here we go. So for argument's sake, let's say this is okay now. It has too much bass, it's a little bit too loud, but you know, for argument's sake, to keep this a little bit short. Yeah, so normally, you know, we would put a little EQ here and maybe we would take this guy and just cut it a little bit because it's too bassy. There we go. So let's see. So we would have our MIDI note then here. Uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, yeah, and of course, you know, you will loop it and have that playing. And then when you're happy with it, uh, you just resample that so that you have your bass sound that you're going to be using for your track. Um, and, um, you know, set this track to sample from, and this is an important bit, that channel. If you sample from the master, you're going to have your master processing on there twice. Uh, and obviously uh, that wouldn't work. Um, so yes, uh, you can do control click to just select only that for sampling. Uh, we're sampling from that bass track. Here we go. So there's our bass sound uh, sidechained. And uh, if we're happy with this now, uh, let's assume this is done. We can drop it over to our bass track and uh, yeah, have that ready to be used in our set. So there we go, that's the workflow. So as you can see, there's no side chaining, there's no effects, there's nothing really happening, no EQing uh, really happening on this multi-track, tape track kind of thing there. Um, yeah, so that's the way this compose section works. I've just put in a few tracks and you can you know, do whatever it is that you wanna do there with your instruments, etc. cetera. Um, but I like to just keep that close so I can keep things as simple as possible to my eyes. I find that that's really helpful when making music definitely less is more. Um, so the final part of the set left for me to look at um, with you is the send effects at the back here. Uh, let me go to a different view so we have a little bit more space. Um, yeah, so there's a long reverb 
uh, which uh, let me just demo it for you. This is the track we want. There's no sound. Why is there? Ah, because there's nothing playing on that track. So let's have a listen to that reverb. As you can see, I've um, cut some of the low and highs of that reverb and, or that reverb return, I should say, and uh, hit bass mono uh, on that return also, uh, having super wide reverbs in the bass, not such a great idea, especially if you're maybe doing some crazy stuff and sending basses to it. Kick drums, it's going to make things very muddy and fizzy in a club. This was an interesting learning actually from watching Dead Mouse. If your kicks and basses are very long, being in an acoustic, you know, in a big room, in a hall, festivals are different, but being in a hall, it'll get very muddy and very, it'll anyway have a lot of ambience and reverb. So if your kicks and bass drums are very long or very, you know, um, are not punchy, uh, it's going to sound really hollow and weird when you're playing in a club. So good tip from Mr. Deadmau5 to keep your kicks shorter than you would think. Um, and uh, make sure that even if they're reverbering in a space, they still have the possibility to uh, sound punchy and clean. There's a funny video, it's called something like Designer of Plugins, This is Dead Mouse. It's some very clickbaity title, but uh, the guy that he works with um, as a part of the company that makes LFO Tool, I forget, um, but that guy, super cool guy, was just kind of joking around that, you know, once he was in a club and he heard an early Deadmau5 track and called him and said, dude, your bass drum doesn't sound very good out here. And yeah, this was also a very interesting learning. So a lot of the drums, the kick drums that you will see in this set are pretty short. Uh, you know, they're, um, have a quick look here. Uh, you can see, well, how long is this? I don't know, is it 100 milliseconds? It's, it's a pretty short and, and punchy kick drum. And I think... Most of them are sort of 100, 150 uh, milliseconds to make sure that if you're playing these out, they don't mess too much with the reverb in the room and with uh, your bass line. So back to the reverbs. Um, that's it for reverb one. Uh, reverb two, let's have a listen to that one. That's a reverb that's nice to use on snare drums and hi-hats. It's a very short, uh, kind of gated, punchy little reverb. Uh, I've taken some mids out because there was a nasty resonance here. This was a great tip. Some YouTube video from uh, Hannes Bieger is his name. Uh, like he's like, yeah, you have to listen to resonances, man. Like, you know, listen to your tracks and see if there's weird resonance in them. Pull them out and have a listen to what this reverb sounds like with and without that uh, resonance filter. So I'm going to take it out for dramatic effect. Notice how there's this like, yeah, it's like this annoying sound. You don't want that in your track and you don't want that building up with every drum sound that you send to it. So that's why there's this weird cut in there. Somehow this reverb has a resonance there that I didn't think was very nice. And again, the lows is cut, the highs is cut substantially and there's a bass mono. Uh, this is boosted a bit because I wanted to get things that if you open your, your sends all the way, you have kind of a similar level coming off all these reverbs back to your master track. Uh, what else do we have? We have a sidechain reverb. That's, uh, yeah, one of the staples of music again, which I think is, yeah, of electronic music, which is really nice to have. This pad is now being sent to this uh, sidechain reverb, which again, it's getting its signal from this key uh, channel over here. And that's it. That's uh, all that there is to say about this sidechain reverb. Uh, very nice, something that I saw on a 
90 minute live production, ah, get his name, over on Signy, it's on YouTube. Um, there was also something with Sebastian, I'm a bit embarrassed, I forget, because it was a really cool tutorial. He did a whole track, including sequencing in 90 minutes, it was super impressive. Uh, very worth uh, watching, I think German only. But I'll, um, I'll dig it out and I'll mention it explicitly in the demo, what is it called, the, the additional, the bonus content that I'm going to be recording at the end of the set. Uh, so I'll take a quick minute to have a look at uh, what his name is. You know what, let's just, let's, let's have a quick look at uh, what his name is, because it was really, it was very cool and it uh, was a really great tip. So let's have a quick look at uh, what his name is called. I think, uh, Rack in 90 Minuten, I think it was in German. Where is he? Uh, feedback? I can't find it. Okay, I'm going to dig it out in just a second and uh, mention it on the other uh, video. Uh, then we have just a delay, a very simple uh, filter delay, again with a little bit of gaining so that it fits nicely into your track. Uh, if you're uh, mixing it in, let's put in this bass. So there we go. There is uh, one of like a basic delay. Whoa, that's a bit of a long feedback for the right side, isn't it? Yeah. Let's take this down a little bit. That's a little bit long. Um, that's it, guys and girls. We've gone through the set. That's all there is really to say about it. Um, I think an important thing for me to say really is Huge thank you uh, to um, all the people that are um, out there making music that, you know, the professionals, the, the, the inspiring masters of music, uh, people like uh, yeah, Frank Wiedemann, Stimming, Sebastian Müller, Dead Mouse, you know, so many people. Earthling, your tutorial, Chelly, my man, really helped me also. It was super cool. Um, yeah, uh, it was just really cool to see how many people are sharing their ideas, their thoughts on music, their workflows, just freely. So we spend less time with all the technical mumbo jumbo, especially at the beginning of our careers and, and more time actually, you know, realizing our musical ideas. Um, I really hope that, did I say thank you? Yes, thank you guys. You know, everyone that, that I was able to learn from and um, in, include some of these learnings into this project and combine it with sort of my sound engineering background to hopefully give you a, a yeah a pack that you can uh, work with quickly and, and get up and started with uh, in, in a way that uh, gets you quick results uh, and that music and creativity stays really fun because at the end of an hour or two you have something where you go wow this is kind of cool I'm proud of it and maybe I'm even going to play it uh, you know at a club or something that's the that's the goal here uh, that that's really the idea for this to just be quick, painless, fast, fun, uh, to be able to do it next to, a, a, you know, having a family and a full-time job, which is my situation now, which, you know, is also cool, it's fun, it's interesting to do different things, but uh, not all of us have the possibility to be full-time musicians. Um, so getting results, getting good results quickly, I think, uh, just keeps it fun and, and keeps it creative and, and allows the possibility for inspiration. I'd like to explicitly say, really, I can really recommend joining some mentorships uh, with people that are experienced, joining some of their uh, workshops, way more than getting an additional piece of hardware or another plugin. Uh, I promise you, you will get better results after spending, for example, uh, a mentorship with Frank Wiedemann or Sebastian Müller. Both of them are incredible on uh, Circle of Live. I'm in the middle of Sebastian Müller. It's actually Sebastian. Love your mentorship also. It's so cool the way Sebastian speaks about um, meditation and, and holding a space for creativity and allowing creativity to flow through you and, and not get too locked down into analyzing and criticizing everything you do, but just being able to create stuff that, that's fun for you and, and letting that talk through the music and, and actually seeing the impact that it has without you know having to, to fuss over every little detail. I think there's a lot of truth in it. I'm loving his mentorship uh, program. I'm in the middle of it now. Uh, Frank Wiedemann's uh, mentorship program changed my life. Frank, thank you so much. Uh, a big part of this set is uh, also uh, things that I saw you doing in, in your workflow. And since I'm doing it this way, I'm having so much more fun in the studio. So 
but the whole story is here. I'd seen Frank's setup and I'd just been too busy with work and I was just doing it, continuing doing it the old way. And then I was in Sebastian Müller's uh, sort of introduction to his class and he was showing, um, he was sharing how important it is to be able to um, work quickly and to uh, achieve good results quickly and to just be able to share that with people and to be in this joy of creating and holding space for that. And I actually got it together, I think, that very evening to build my first version of this set. And since then, I've just been having a lot of fun in the studio. I've managed to release a track almost every week, with exception of some weeks where I was just really busy with work or I had a cold. But yeah, like being able to put out a track kind of on a weekly basis because the work is just fast uh, is, yeah, it's so much more fun than spending a month, you know, trying to perfect something sort of in the evening wee hours of the morning or something before work. Um, being able to get good results quick is it's definitely, uh, yeah, a just much more enjoyable process. So I hope that this is what this, um, what this set uh, will give you or, or maybe inspire you towards also. Um, I'm going to be doing a little bit of bonus content on these headphones uh, that I'm wearing here by Slate, uh, which is a huge recommendation um, that, I, uh, yeah, that I can speak positively about and a, a plugin called Adapter AB by Plugin Alliance. I think the company that makes this is called Spectral Audio or something. We'll, we'll look at it in a, in a separate video. Uh, but from the point of view of making music in, in Ableton quickly, um, yeah, this is my recommendation. This is my uh, setup. And obviously I have the luxury here of having a lot of uh, outboard gear and hardware to create good sounds with really quickly. But I've also created really nice sounds from, I don't know, stuff from Arturia that are VSTs, definitely from stuff from Ableton. The wave synth that they have is super cool. The drum racks are fantastic. Just drop your samples in there. So really with Ableton Suite, um, you should be set to do anything uh, you want if you're inspired to do an Ableton type workflow. Obviously, uh, Logic is amazing also. Bitwig is super cool. Guys from Bitwig, Placidus, super awesome guys. I just have not had the time yet to learn Bitwig properly, but it is coming. I've just been focused on trying to get tracks done, but I'm looking forward to learning Bitwig because I have a feeling it's the next level and the guys that are making it are super cool. Actually, I know it's the next level. I've, I've had a peek at some of the videos and you can stuff there, do stuff there. You can have like a combined arrangement layout. Um, why is this not working anymore? Computer frozen. Uh, in any case, you can have a combined arrange and clip layout uh, in, um, in Bitwig. So I'm looking forward to that also. This is weird. I have no idea why. Ah, there we go. I just have to smack it. I just realized there's one thing I didn't show you, but people will know this who make music with Ableton. But obviously, the nice thing of building a set in this layout is that you can um, record your sequence live at the end of it. So let me show you that really quickly, just to give you an idea. So let's say this is the track that I'm going to be starting on, and I've done my sketch, and now I want to record my rough sequence, I don't want to drag and drop all these blocks and play Tetris on my computer. I want to make music. So here we go.
Okay, so I hope, you know, gives you a little bit of an idea. So what you've seen now is that I've just been messing with, you know, all kinds of automation and stuff in real time and created my yeah, sketch of a track, you know, something that I can get started with and, and start to create uh, a sequence in real time based on my feelings rather than on, you know, the Tetris game of dropping blocks around. So if I want to then say, okay, this is cool. I want to I want to sequence this. I want to turn this into a project. Uh, I hit that button over here. Now this is what Ableton is concerned with. And here we go. Yeah, so um, that's the beauty of, of Ableton for this kind of work. You know, you can then make your sequence live and, and have a lot more fun in the process uh, while you're doing that. So now we truly have covered everything. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your time watching this. This became a little bit longer than I thought, um, but I hope that it's of value to you and that this template uh, helps you out. Um, as you probably know, if you're seeing this, I've made this template available for $1 on um, called Gumroad uh, because I just want anyone that's making music to have access to this and if that's what you can afford then that's what you could afford that's cool um, of course I appreciate if you can afford a bit more and you want to you know tip me or send me some dosh some other way then that's super cool I'm not exactly sure how that works on Gumroad if you can I don't know send me something by PayPal or whatever but what also helps is if you follow me on social media and you know um, connect with me there Obviously, that helps to get bookings and, and whatnot. And actually, I'm really bad at social media. I have like very low followers on all my profiles. So that would also be a fantastic support. If, uh, if this has been of value to you, um, then uh, yeah, super cool. That would help me a lot also. And uh, for the rest, uh, yeah, have a good time uh, making music, uh, hopefully getting good results. I'm really looking forward to your feedback on this workflow. And uh, I hope that it's also worked well for you. And uh, yeah, I'm sure there will be some more videos kind of, of things you can do in the studio now that I finally figured out how all this screen grabbing stuff works. Uh, I'm actually finding it really fun to do also. And uh, yeah, let me play some music and uh, have a good one, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Bye bye. OK, so you can get the template over on Gumroad. I'll link it below the video. Uh, it's uh, one dollar, one euro uh, to get it. Uh, tips are appreciated as well as uh, follows and likes on social media. Uh, but yeah, more than anything, I hope that this uh, template is useful to you, that you get off to a flying start with it if you're a beginner. And I wish you a great time in the studio. All right, take care. Bye bye.